Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Keep the Mic On. I am Simply Sherry. You know, each week since the start of the quarantine, we have been here with an interview with an artist that we love and respect. Um, this week's interview was a little different because we're not exactly live uh, to support our special guest in their other endeavors. We are recording a couple of days early. There may be a few extra people coming in with us, uh, but we thank you for watching. I am going to kick it to the first Black Poet Laureate of Alexandria City, Kaniki Jakarta. Thank you, Sherry, and welcome, everybody. Um, don't forget to subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. Don't forget to um, also make donations to us. It's Keep the Mic On. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all those things. As she said, I am Kaniki Jakarta, happily serving this three years term as the first Black Poet Laureate of Alexandria, Virginia. Very excited about the uh, special guest today. I'm always excited, though, but extremely excited because I just seen him live and in person and you don't get to do that these days. Yes, so yes, I yes. am <laughs> going to kick it to um, Danielle. They don't call her the girl genius for nothing. Hey everyone. I am girl genius. Um, first I'm going to introduce our fourth member who's not here, but I'll, I'll tell you about her week. Um, our other, the other member of our collective is charity Blackwell. Her week is called art plus therapy. And, um, I'm I'm just happy to be here this week. Uh, as everyone else said, we are recording a little early this week because we have a special guest and we wanted to make sure that we got him in on this segment of the show specifically. So um, my week, as it is my week, is called Let's Talk About the Book. So during my segment, I basically pick an author or someone who has a product and get them to discuss, you know, their processes and, and uh, their book and, you know, the things that people would ask you as a writer, since that's where my passion is. I'm, not, I'm a writer aside from poetry. So that's where we are. And this week, I have the immense pleasure of interviewing Breeze. And for those of you who have not, who don't know who Breeze is or who have not met him yet, oh, you are in for a whole treat this week. And I'm super excited about this. So um, per this bio that's happening over here, and then I'll, I'll pull him in. Oh, look, at, there you go. Look at that. You already pulled yourself into the room. Did um, I do that? I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm getting ready to do the bio. <laughs> I'm touching stuff. <laughs> it's not touching stuff. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, just go do your bio. This is good. So he is a spoken word artist, author, slam coach, battle rapper, and he's from Richmond. He's performed all over the country, including venues such as the Broward Center for Performing Arts and Historic Apollo Theater. He is a TV One Lexus Presents versus the Flow alum and a national slam champion, which he left out of his bio. I did I? Yes, you did. It is not in your bio, but I know this because I know this. He is a he is oh, okay. a he is a he is a national slam champion. I'm not gonna let that slide because we're gonna discuss that a little bit. Okay, uh, well, if you're not gonna let that slide, process. then you shouldn't. If you're no, not gonna let that slide, then never you let that slide. You shouldn't <laughs> let the fact that I want eye whips slide. Yes, either. I'm not gonna let I'm not gonna let it slide that you want eye whips either. <laughs> for, okay, I'm for, sure. for people who wanted to know, I, I whips is the individual world poetry slam. So there you go. So did we have some people who like poetry and may not necessarily be immersed in the world of slam the way you and I are. So, okay. so we'll break this down a little bit for them. Um, but I am going to take myself out for a couple of seconds and I'm going to let him introduce himself via uh, a nice little piece and, and then I, and they will come back and we'll do the questions. All right. All right. It's on you. Awesome. Um, hey, everybody. How you is? I'm Breeze. I like this the poet. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna do a poem that I have not done, but like uh, one time. So please forgive me if I have to read it. <clears throat> a Facebook post of defeat. Something is wrong with me, y'all. I'm not motivated to write 
much less compete. And I really don't know what to do. My friends throw flowers and speak of my need for rest and peace, but it only reminds me of how dead I feel inside. Another friend comes through and comments and it grips like the love of a boa constrictor telling me to hold myself together. He says, you have the rest of your life to chill and grieve and rest and die. Get off your ass and go lose and lose again until you are tired of losing and then go win. Cause that's what we do. That's all we do. And have you ever heard a defibrillator shock your pulse into action whenever you are thinking that you are a corpse of a person in this world? What I heard was, what you doing down here, boy? All rock bottom resolve like this. How you forget the dirt when you got everything you own out the mud? Boy, you ain't tainted or soiled. You are soil. You ain't stuck. You're planted. You are rooted exactly where you need to be. But here you go, standing all fruitless tree looking famished. But you show me a bush and I'll show you a ram in it. What's wrong with you? Everything you fighting for and all of a sudden you're content with being a victim, a casualty. And one thing a blessed fool always got is the audacity to think that you can afford to not be a blessing. The fact that you made it out of all you went through is exactly what your purpose and anointing gets you. How you think you broke? Because you ain't got no money. Like your mind ain't money. Like your brain ain't a brand or you forgot how that child support got paid before a nine to five wage. Didn't you take the last 10 you had and flip it into a 30? Took those 30s and flipped them into great birthdays. You went from homeless on a Greyhound bus bench to a Greyhound bus trip to a dope ass Christmas for them awesome ass kids. What's all this broken? You are like, like you ain't a socket wrench sonnet, a, a screwdriver soliloquy, like you can't hammer to nail Hail Marys in the hearts like that woman, that one woman ain't stay alive after hearing your poem and now has a gorgeous baby boy. Ain't your words help create life when she decided not to give a fuck and ain't that immaculate conception and you got the nerve to be walking around looking like ain't shit biblical about you. How did you forget how to lose? Didn't you lose your soulmate on a Christmas Eve and still granted yourself the gift of life after the morning? Didn't you lose your first king of the south and ain't lose again for five years? Your first gnats and won the very next one? Your first eye whips and won the very next one? Didn't you lose yourself and didn't you find yourself in all this bullshit before and still you won? You beat every heartbreak when you let yourself love anyway. You beat depression every time you get out of bed. I am asking, what are you doing down here? Looking lost, looking like you lost when the fact is you won as soon as you showed up. Because that's what we do. That's all we do is show up and win. Thank you. I had to add myself back in like, oof, oof. Now, now I'm gonna start with asking you about that one specifically before yes, we get into the book. So, so tell me, not that it's not kind of self-explanatory, but just tell me what goes, what what went into that one? What into what went into that piece? That that one that one touched a couple nerves, yo. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, after not writing, not performing, COVID kind of screwed up a lot of people and I, me in particular, um, poetry and itself, but also the idea, concept or the platform of slam um, is like really big to me. I'm truly competitive, but slam is also where I get free, honestly. Um, um, I'm, I don't know. I'm just, I just love it like that. So when you remove something from somebody, it's like removing a limb. Like I, yeah. nobody was, you know, there's no energy and they're having stuff that's like online, but it's like, you don't get the same energy. You don't get fed the same way. Um, so then you starve, you know what I mean? Yeah, Until like, yeah, you know, and, and, and that's kind of what was happening. I, you know, 
was hungry for a stage or just energy, not even just a stage, but energy, just being around that energy. So I was in a depression. I couldn't write. I couldn't, I, there was no way to perform. I couldn't do anything. I didn't feel like an artist anymore. And I went into a really like dark space and I made that post. It was a Facebook post that I made. And the person who responded, everybody was like, oh, you just need to rest. Hey, you've been doing a lot. You're like, you know, you just came off this run that you was on. Like, you know, you need to chill. It's okay if you just let yourself chill. And then Lamar Hill um, was like, the fuck is you talking about? And, and, and that was his, that was like literally his comment. And it hit me, it, it rocked me. It was like, okay, so yeah, I need to get up. I need to get up. It was like a decision made in that time to stop feeling bad or down on myself or whatever. And like that poem is like a declaration of that. Like that stuff, very, like he wrote that comment. And like, I think the very next day I wrote that poem like yo nah like and and then from then i was like nah i gotta get up i gotta move i gotta i gotta get back to myself before i lose it you know so yeah. that's what went into that one i i feel like coming out of coming out of co coming into and out of COVID, right i feel like mm -hmm. there were two types of things that happened it was either you fell into the group that needed to keep moving in order for things to make sense and or the ones that pumped the brakes and didn't realize they needed to pump the brakes, <laughs> you know. Oh, word. Like, yeah, I, I didn't realize mm -hmm. I needed the rest. I didn't realize I didn't. I needed it because I was coming off of right before we went to lockdown. So I told the story a couple times. My mom passed right before Wowps and like literally two days before Wowps and right before we went into lockdown. Mm -hmm. So I didn't realize I needed to pump my brakes until this happened. Oh wow. Yeah, I um I um hmm, that's a whole thing because right before we went into lockdown, I as I mentioned in the poem, well, first of all, I went through a, like a breakup after like a 3-year relationship. Um everything tied into that relationship and I'm in a completely different city. So then that's when I moved from Charlotte back to Richmond. Right. Um in the midst of that, I was already grieving the relationship, even though I didn't know it. If you would have asked me, I would have thought I was fine. Like I was like, oh, I'm good. But, you know, I got certain triggers that kind of take me to a place and I didn't really know what they meant. But it was me grieving the relationship. Um, and then in the midst of that, <clears throat> uh, Christmas Eve, uh, somebody that is insanely close to my heart, like the closest I think I'll ever let somebody be um, passed on Christmas, on like Christmas Eve. So this is all right before COVID. So if COVID like really went crazy, like in March, this is like the right December. Before. Yeah, like, you know, this is the, the December right before that March. Um, so I went even more into depression and actually became suicidal. Like, um, uh, so I had, don't honestly it's a sad thing to think about but it was like i was so depressed that i couldn't get myself up to act out the thoughts in my head that's real though um so then i made it because of that i ended up making it to the funeral and i had a conversation with her uh at her funeral and she was like no you got to be here you know you got to be here that's kind of the word or the energy i got from just being in her presence you know and saying goodbye so i was like okay i'm gonna be here then like she said i gotta be here i'm gonna be here and then i start setting up dates battles slams tours i was like look if i'm gonna be here i'm gonna be here i'm gonna get up look let's go and then like everything was supposed to start in march and then yeah exactly. There you go. exactly so that led all the way up to the poem because <laughs> now yeah. i got myself up and got all this energy up that look i'm gonna go i'm gonna i'm gonna push myself out of this space i'm gonna and then yeah so march happened COVID happened knocked all this shit over <laughs> 
And uh, and it was, I didn't know what to do with myself. I started trying to do the online stuff. It wasn't really the same energy. Honestly, I, I just, for you, it, it's not, it's, I didn't realize, like, I needed the break. Don't get me wrong on my end. But I didn't realize how much I miss just the energy of the room and nothing else and how much you feed off of it until... I just did my first live event, I want to say a month ago. I have not done a live event, anything since between March of last year and last month. Mm. I had not been in a room with full of poets. Mm. And so when I walked in, uh, I'm, I realize I'm a rusty, <laughs> slightly rusty. Right. Oh, <laughs> Which is, that realization. It, it's fine. It was it was fine because it was just a it it was when Bus Boys Baltimore just had their first event and I went. I said like, I'll just do it open mic, no problem. And hey, right. I realized I was rusty. <laughs> I realized that it feeds. It's, it's it's a whole different thing. You right. don't realize how much you miss it until you're in the room. So I totally right. totally understand that. I get yeah, it. I'm an extremely like affectionate person. Um, I um, am kind of known for like hugs. And um, it was a sense of it was a situation where, you know, when I'm in that space, that's literally almost all I'm doing is like I'm getting energy, whether it's from the crowd, whether it's from hearing art and, and getting inspired creatively, you know, um, or if it's just giving love, you know, hugs and stuff like that. And it was in a situation where I didn't feel like I got hugged back. And like for a very long time like this whole like any situation that i've been in or involved interaction that i've been in during the whole like COVID thing is like i was giving people hugs i was giving people energy i didn't feel like i was getting hugged back so i wouldn't feel like i and then so i don't have that i'm not getting artistically or creatively filled i'm not getting my energy filled and so yeah i was just running on e until like like a month or so ago, like maybe two months or so ago, I just started pushing myself to jump back into things again um, since everything started like opening back up or whatever. So yeah, it was a, it was a bad space, but I'm back kind of, That's yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm up and I'm good and, and we here and we writing and And, and yeah. we're digging on the writing in a minute, but I say, well, I, I, well, A, it's good to see you back. B, I, I will emphasize that uh, taking care of your uh, like 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 depression and mental health stuff is like I cannot emphasize enough how that is a big deal. Like making sure you're in the right headspace and you're making you know you're making the right decisions for taking care of yourself is like paramount. Mm -hmm. We we get into that a little bit like almost every show where we're like. You know, we do, even if we're just doing a check-in, like, what have you been doing to, like, Sherry always asks a question, and I'm quite sure she'll ask at the end, too. Um, Sherry always asks people, like, um, like, what did you do during a pandemic to for self-care? And I, I don't, and you don't have to answer that now, because I'm pretty sure it's going to come up at the end, but I just want to kind of emphasize that that's a thing, <laughs> you know? And not enough people address it, to be completely honest. Right. Um, um kind of trying to save that for the end as far as the when the conversation comes up but yeah i um shit is real <laughs> yeah it was hard to have yourself in mind you know or like have your your desires in mind you know what i'm saying the, the self-care aspect of it rather than the survival mode of it all you know what i'm saying it was really really hard to like yeah. to like focus to like break focus from survival mode enough to do something you know what i mean that that was genuinely like peace or something to you i mean um here recently you know i don't know i just i've been trying to find it in everything you know trying to find it in everything because during that time frame there was nothing around to find it in, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was like, I just try to find peace and joy and in, in everything. You know, yeah. that's, I, I do that now. 
I did it before, but I, I made a bigger emphasis of it now. I find joy in little, little stuff. I did it yeah. like it's weird. Like I was I was hanging out with my daughter. We were sitting around watching. I think we were sitting around like either watching movies or playing Mortal Kombat. And I'm like, this right here, like the availability, right. the availability of me to be able to sit here and play video games. With you, this is it. You know, right. <laughs> I did a battle. I did a battle not too long ago. And um I had a bar. Me and my daughter was sitting here watching Bubble Guppies, my three year old. <laughs> she was watching Bubble Guppies, and I ended up writing a bu Bubble Guppy bar into my battle. And then I was like, uh, I was like, yo, I told dude, like, use the first battle rapper on, on the league to get your ass kicked by a three year old. And then I got the, like, I, I hit her mom up, like, the day while I'm at the battle. She, like, Oh, I'm pulling up, and she brought my daughter to the battle. It was like, yo, <laughs> that's crazy. This is, and so I'm on stage rapping. I was like, say, well, say hi to my daughter, because you <laughs> and she waving, and yo, it was crazy. I'm finding stuff like that, like little big stuff like that. Little stuff like summer means that the Baja Blast Mountain Dew is in a bottle. It's like <laughs> seasonal. And I get like two of those a day because I know I'm not supposed to be drinking soda, but like that's my joy. <laughs> I can't do I can't do Mountain, Mountain Dew. Dew my joy. <laughs> I can't do Mountain Dew for as listen. I don't really do so. Listen, my joy is in this cup, okay? I'm over right. here drinking a cup of coffee. Right. Joy is in this cup. And for all of this, I, legit, I promise you I can't do Mountain Dew. <laughs> I legit, I legit don't drink anything but soda I among mean, water and liquor. That's yeah. all I drink. I'm either drinking water or I'm getting drunk. Yeah. So for me to drink a soda that doesn't have <laughs> liquor in it is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So summer for me, summer for me is always Slurpees. Ah. Uh-huh. Summer is summer. I know you can get them year round, but I'm just saying something about catching a Slurpee in the middle of summer is just everything in life. It is. <laughs> it is. And and I'm gonna throw this out there. So if anybody has a 7-Eleven app, I believe this is the last week you can get the free Slurpees. See, that's that's my thing. Slurpees and a regular, even like in the summer, not really. But when they put out that ad for the free Slurpee, oh, it's a yeah. It feel like it's a community thing. Like everybody gonna be at 7-Eleven. Yeah. So yeah. Free Slurpee day. Free I like. I'm listen. Fat girl knows all the holidays, okay? I said it like this. Like, I know all the weird food holidays. Like, I know coffee day. I know, like, donut day. Ben and Jerry's that, day. Yeah, donut day, day is the yeah, Donut day is the thing for me. Like, if I, I pat myself on the back very, you know, I feel very proud of myself if I catch Krispy Kreme day. Yep, Krispy Kreme day. You a free yeah, Krispy that's my thing. Robin's day, all of that. So Slurpee Day, they decided this year to do it like instead of because they didn't want people in this like crowding the stores because it was because of COVID. They were like, listen, if you got the app, you can get it all month long. Oh, that's all you had to say. Say more. And it's till the yeah. end of this month. And this month don't end till Saturday. Thanks. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's weird. <sighs> this is, you know what? This is going to be the line that goes in the clip. So, no, no, no. Every <laughs> time, every time that we, like at the end of these shows, we take and archive them. On so we can because I'm going to create a podcast from past season shows and I always say like you know host so and so and guest so and so talk about you know like I list like three random things so this one's gonna be like Slurpees, <laughs> <laughs> That's Slurpees dope. and something else and whatever else comes out of this conversation. Uh, we've had some we've had some weird ones. We had we were talking about uh, there was an interview earlier with a, another author. We, I believe uh, this. Somehow or another, we got to talking about uh, writing in coffee shops. I want to say it was John Good. We were talking about writing in coffee shops, and mm -hmm. that was funny. That whole segment was just hilarious. Right. <laughs> right. But speaking of books and books and books, and this is why we're here. So first of all, because I didn't say it, you introduced what is the name of the book? Um, The name of the book. The I have two different ones. Book. Huh? I have two different books. Um, um, one of them is called uh, Serenity Song, um, Whole, Hem Whole Hems for Broken Peace. Um, <clears throat> the other book is a two-part. I didn't know how to execute it, so I did it as best I could. But it's, it's a two-part book. It's like one part personal, one part like social justice. 
Um, so I, I, I mean, it reads kind of like a play, I guess. Um, it's called uh, one part is called American History X, the miseducation of, um, and the other part is called uh, the praise dance of a sinner. Um, so uh, American History X, the miseducation of, is like a spin off of certain uh, ideals or certain people or certain things. So uh, there's uh, white supremacy. Um, but I heard or seen on Twitter, somebody made a post, a white person made a post that said about, I can't remember what the situation was, but she said, uh, this is just another example of black supremacy. There's and as it as if as if it was in line or synonymous with white supremacy in some kind of way. And so it's like so it's the miseducation of black supremacy. Um, I have a poem um, that's kind of spun off of a change going to come. Um, so it's, it's called the miseducation of Sam Cooke. So and in which case it's like, yeah, change came but they changed it to the same thing. You know what I mean? Um, and that's how they got us. We said a change was gonna come and it, they changed, but they changed it to the same thing. So instead of cops, it's, I mean, instead of, you know, slave slavery, it's it's prison instead of, you know, so ju it's just a spinoff of, same of, of ideas. And stuff. Same system, plastic surgery. There you go. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, so, and the praise dance of a sinner is kind of self-explanatory. It's like, uh, just personal situations that uh, that usually have a triumphant kind of like overtone or just a very, um, just resilience, just being able to push yourself through. Um, most of the poems in that aspect are, are, um, are based on that. My first book was just me being excited to write a book like, cause I, I gotta tell you, I didn't believe I could. Um, that surprises my, me. Yeah, I didn't believe I could. I always, you gotta understand when I first started writing, um, I was so excited about writing or oh, poetry. I was so excited about poetry. And my friend Roscoe Burnham's, he had to sit me down a couple times like, yo, I'm worried about your poetry because you don't edit anything. What are you doing? Every time I see you, you show up with oh. five new poems. <laughs> you show up with five new poems every time I seen you and I just seen you three days ago. Why are you, why do you have five new poems in three days? When did you stop to edit any of these? What are you doing? And I didn't care. <clears throat> Wasn't listening oh. to him at all. Then oh. you go into seeing people who, then you go, you get into slam. And then like my first real experience with slam was here in Richmond. And it was like, um, um, somebody, I won't, I don't want to give them a, a, a negative like outlook. Cause they, you know, it's not even about that, but, um, so I won't name them, but they said, you're a dope performer. You're, you're okay. Performer. And when you get your writing as good as your performance, you'll be an okay poet. Like that was one of the first things they said to me. So all of this stuff is just playing in my head. You know what I mean? Um, then I'm looking at people who write and who write books or who write differently than me and who know form and, and, and who study like stuff. And me, I'm just going off sheer passion and emotion and feeling and energy of just writing. I don't have the background. I don't have the studying or, or any of that for real. So when it came to writing books, I just never thought I was adequate. I, I mean, I make a CD. I try to make a video. Y'all can catch me, you know, doing video like my videos on YouTube. But as far as a book is concerned, I've seen people write books and do amazing things in their writing with with formatting and stuff like that. Like I've seen all of that. I can't, I don't know how to do any of that. So I just never thought I was adequate enough to write a book until I wrote it. <laughs> True. I was going to say that I think, I think, I think really successful, really not even really successful uh, poets probably need a, a good balance of both. There are people that have had absolutely no training 
and just kind of took what they got in and incorporated it. And then there's people that had the formal training and, you know, I've right. seen people with formal training who aren't that good, you know, <laughs> you, have, you have to think it's true because you have, and, and, and it's not for lack of trying It's You got to figure out what the balance is that works out for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 There are, there, yeah, there, yeah, is was- a, there are people who are better. I'm not saying there's a difference between page and stage. I'm just saying there's some people that are better on page. Some people that have better on stage and some people who have mastered both. Right. Right. I, I would say I'm better on stage, but I've definitely have opened myself up to working on um, doing page more. I have a lot of poems that I don't perform on stage because I feel like they're better page poems, but I also can't help but write in a way that get that even that gives page poems legs you know what i mean right. it, it, it gives it, you know it gives it give it gives it like when you read it it feels like if it, it feels like movement it feels like performance when you read it you know what i mean um and i think that's just because you know my brain is already fixated on a performative aspect you know in a performative level or whatever but um I'm it working a lot a, on it should have life to it it should have life to it don't get me wrong on page it should have some life to it Right. You know, I am. I'm honestly going to tell you, I if any if people have seen me enough to know I'm a much better page person than I ever performer because I'm not I am not a performance person. Right. I never have been. However, I write for a living and have since I was a teenager. So, of right. course, page is going to come a little bit easier for me. Right. But I have learned to appreciate wholeheartedly how hard it is to master both things. Right. I I have done so as well. And I think one of the things that really inspire me to start implementing more page page poems with with life behind it, page poems that that feel like action, you know, so more so than just like words or whatever is, you know, because I was an avid, like avidly. I was like sincerely against the idea of like form. Like I always thought, I always thought like, yo, like, like, why would you put more emphasis on how you write in the poem than what you're talking about? You know what I mean? Like, that's what it felt like to me. It felt like, it felt like you were more worried about making sure line three and line one uh, interchange and go into the next stanza. And, so, and, you know, that repetition is supposed to make, it felt, it felt like that to me. It was like, yo, Half, half the time you read these poems just for the sake of like trying to execute the form, it don't feel like you really had a message. You was just writing. You know what I'm saying? Just to put I'm words together. For a couple of reasons. I'm laughing for a couple of reasons. One, I adore form because Word. I am a page nerd and I like looking at the structure mm-hmm. and, it, and if done right, it's fantastic no but see that's the thing that's the thing if done right so this is what i was experiencing right (laughs) and i didn't so i i personally was like yo like i that was past tense so then here we go i end up in charlotte north carolina and the year the year yep the year we won nationals this genius ass poet named Jay Ward invites me to a group piece. Mind you, this was a very last minute invite. If the group piece was supposed to be him and two other poets on our team and uh, one of the poets dropped out and they were gonna scrap the poem entirely. I was pissed because I don't know why they didn't ask me to be in in the first place, but I wasn't gonna say anything. So at the very last minute, they're like, yo, can you write into this? And I wrote into it and blocked it. He wrote, he invited me. He, I wrote my part and he put it together. We did a contrapuntal. That's the one. That's exactly why I started laughing. We did a contrapuntal on final That's stage the of National Poetry Slam and won nationals with a contrapuntal on a final stage. And I would have never in my life. And thought. it was absolutely brilliant. It was it was absolutely brilliant. I was there and it was an absolutely brilliant poem. 
I would have never thought that that could happen. And when I got a taste of that, like, yo, like that can do that. Oh man, mm -hmm. it was, it was open from then. It was open from then. And then not too long later, I ended up at Rust Belt. Um, and it wasn't a poem I did. It's a Rust Belt poetry slam. It was in regional poetry slam. It was in St. Louis. And it wasn't a poem I did or I was a part of, but it was a poem I got to witness. Uh, his name is Zach Goldberg. He has a poem called Blackout. It's an erasure poem, which I didn't, I had never heard of this poem before. It's an erasure poem in which each, each time he, so he does a poem. If you don't know what a erasure poem is, you do a poem and then you erase certain lines or certain words yeah. to create like a different poem. He did it like in five and each poem was an erasure of the shot he took. So it was like he was getting drunk, he was drinking, each poem was a shot. So each poem, he sounded more and more drunk. That was the purpose of the erasure. The erased words to make himself sound drunk until he got to the end. I was like, I'm going to recommend, I said, and I think I've before, I'm, I'm going to recommend two of my favorite poems are actually form poems, like two of my favorite poems ever done. Mm -hmm. One of them is, if you've never read it, I literally threw the book across <laughs> Barnes and Noble and yelled out, fuck, Barnes and Nobles over Terrence Hayes' Golden Shovel. Terrence Hayes' Golden Shovel. There's a poem you need to know in advance of that one. To figure out what he did with it, but I literally threw the book across Barnes and Nobles. It, it's it, the Golden Shovel is a form. Mm -hmm. and the second one I would recommend, and I'll put it in the comments, uh, but for for this recording and also for uh, the people in the audience, there is a uh, youth poet. I don't think she's a youth poet anymore, but she was at B and B a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and I, I think her name is somebody recommended that we have her on the show, and I'm just trying to get in touch with her. Her name is Laurel Chang, I think. Mm -hmm. an erasure poem at B and V that is literally like one of the most amazing poems I have ever heard. She did mm -hmm. that files at B and V, and the poem is she took the N four hundred immigration form that's like mm -hmm. thirty four pages long and made an erasure poem out of it, and it's freaking brilliant. That's it is crazy. a brilliant poem. That's crazy. Mm hmm. Okay, but see, so stuff like that, I started experiencing stuff like that, and now I am, I am, I am a fan of form. I am a fan of form because I see the possibilities of it. It was a, it was a weapon against performance art, performance poetry for a long time for me. Like a lot of people used it as a way to kind of separate like elitist you know what i mean like an elitist kind of mentality like oh you can't do this you don't write like this you didn't do this thing with this poem and didn't put this like that and do that so it's like you know they kind of you know belittled spoke let's put let's say like performative poetry or spoken word you know um the uh academic academia you know what i'm saying of, of poetry or whatever like that's where you would find form most of the time. And those and people who dabble in that a lot of in a lot of times try to, you know, downplay or look at, you know, performative art or spoken word or whatever, a certain kind of way. And it wasn't until I, you know, made interactions with people who brilliantly did both at the same time and wasn't afraid to take the chance to put it on a stage, put it in front of everybody. You know what I mean? You gotta have a lot of nerve. You got to have a hella audacity to put a contrapuntal on a final stage of a national poetry slam. You got to, you got to have some kind of, you know, nerve about you, some kind of bravery to take that risk. And um, I was so blessed to be around people who, who, who were willing to take that risk. And now I, I have a completely different outlook on, on form and, and, and the, the possibilities of it. I'm gonna throw this out there for anybody who doesn't know what this is, what we're talking about, by the way, because uh, somebody in the, in the background asked me about what a contrapuntal is. 
So the way oh, this works is, so for, for anybody who's unfamiliar with form, so contrapuntal is, it's usually a, a poem where there's three stanzas and they're, they're, they're next to each other. Each one of these is a standalone piece. Each, each section of this poem is a standalone piece. However, when you read it all the way across, it is also a separate piece. Right. And so you write the poems changes. Right. You, you write the poems the vertically. Thing. You write the poems vertically and it's individual pieces vertically. Yep. But when you set them beside each other and read them horizontally, it's a completely different poem. And there are like so many different versions of it. Like I, like I, somebody showed me a poem that was a contrapuntal that was like, uh, it was like five of them, but they were like, they were, they were like one, one, one in the middle and then one, one. So you can read each poem by itself. Then you can read from this to the middle. That was a poem from this to the middle up here was a poem diagonal straight all of them all every direction you read any of them was a completely different poem i was like you gotta be out of your fucking mind <laughs> like, like that I'm, is I'm a fan of breaking forms too i i break and create forms i have yeah. i have broken and create i have one that i think i think i talked to i think roscoe and i talked about this before i have one called a devil's destina that i have mm. not i've only been able to write one and i haven't recreated anything like it mm. So uh, someone here in Baltimore cre and created something called a, a six by six, mm. which is What's six lines, six words per line. And everyone's a stand. Every line is a standalone poem, like a standalone sentence. That's so, crazy. Right. So you got you got six lines and you can and the way he does it is he'll write them. And then you can say you can reverse the lines in any order. And the poem still makes sense because he's a whole standalone thoughts. That's crazy. So I did that. I did it with a Sestina. I, oh I took God. those six. I wrote I wrote six separate stanzas and I rearranged the, the end words the way you do with the uh -huh. Sestina. So you right. now have six stanzas, six lines per stanza, six words per line. And it, all it, of the lines are all, all the lines are standalone. Standalone. And every single and then, line But if you read them all together, it's a, that's crazy. But then if you read all six... All six stands are stand alone and all six lines are stand alone. All six See, lines are stand alone. This is stuff like that is why I once believed I never I shouldn't be writing books. <laughs> so, I, I can't mean, do that. I just like it is complicated. Kim he's like, that's complicated. It is. I wrote down how to do it. Like if you've if you ever seen how to write a Cecina, it's just you gotta rearrange the last six words. So because mm -hmm. you use the same six words all the way through the whole poem as right. the end lines that just come in a certain order. So you kind of already have fixed words in place. So you got to be very careful about which six words you decide to go with. <laughs> I, right. I do want to ask you, what's a golden shovel? Oh, okay. So golden shovel. And you got so hyped. Yeah. I love it. Golden I shovel. love this. Like I, said, man, I, I have scared. not been able to write one. I don't think I've ever been able to write one. So basically the, the poem in question is literally called golden shovel because it's named after you know, um, Gwendolyn Brooks, we, the, the poem that's usually called We Real Cool? Yeah. That poem is, is not called We Real, uh, we Real Cool. It's actually called uh, Seven Pool Players of the Golden Shovel. So you need okay. to know that poem in advance of know, of figuring out what he did. So basically, a golden shovel is uh, the end line. Um, I guess I'll ruin it for you, but we'll, you'll, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'll ruin it for you, but the last word in the poem every single line down the right hand side is a is a poem like down the side is a whole separate poem that runs throughout the length of what he's written so the first the first word of each stanza the last the, the last, last word, word of every line the last the last, word every, the last word of every line the last word so of every it's line, his own individual poem it's, it's a whole but, individual poem. But the last word of, of every, every line, line. If you read is it down, the, if you need to read it down the right hand side, it's a whole separate poem. That's if you read the last word in every line, just down, just right down the right hand side, it's a whole separate poem. <laughs> That's crazy. And and it, and the thing is, he does it not once, but twice in the same poem. He wrote. How do you do that? Part, he wrote a two-part poem. 
Oh, okay. He wrote a two-part poem, and it's the same poem. It's just there's a break in between the stanzas, right? Okay, got it. And he he wrote the poem. He wrote the poem down the right hand side, and then he incorporated it again by breaking words in half. Oh. And it's crazy. Yes, yeah, that's makes, never gonna he, happen. He literally yeah. broke words in half to make this second poem the exact same. It's 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 insane. It is insane. So if you just read the last word in the line, you just like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. And then you then just get mad and throw the book. Like I only want to write. Yeah, no yeah. Book. That's 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 what happens. That's yeah, you throw books. You throw I books when that happens. Find, I will actually find a copy of that poem somewhere because I, I want to say I, I have it saved and tagged on a okay. some website, like some poetry website. I will find a copy of it and I will post it on our page. Yeah, I need to, I need to so see that. Everybody, that's, that's so that everybody fire. can see what I'm talking about because when I tell you this is insane. Yeah, that's gonna be crazy. I was like, I I want to try one, and I have tried one, but I can't get through it because I I just I don't have the wherewithal yet to do that. I've done other ones, not that. I tried to do things. I tried to do things. I tried to make a contrapuntal out of haikus. It actually came out pretty good. Actually came out pretty good, but I haven't shared it. I haven't done anything with it. I just I just left it alone. But it was just an attempt. Haikus are my thing. Haikus huh? are my thing. Haikus yeah. are my thing. And I, I'm a big I know we talk about form all day. I'm I'm haikus are my thing because and I, I started with the haikus because I'm I'm a I'm an asshole sometimes. And it's really okay. easy to just do really snarky one liners with haiku. I promise you that's all right. I, yeah. I can do really snarky one liners. Yeah, and I don't have to overcomplicate it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But, I so my question, and I, I want to get through the, the the next couple of questions before I open this up for um everybody to kind of come back in and ask whatever they want. Um, mm -hmm. there are a couple things I want to ask, and then I specifically had that last question uh before before Sherry, and I want to give you a chance to close out too. We got okay. we got time though. Um. Okay. You, it's funny. We actually covered a lot of what's on my interview questions in this conversation okay. already. So that's great without me even having to go there with it. Um, right. What is, what does your, well, first of all, I didn't, I didn't ask you yet. How did you even get started writing poetry in the first place? Um, high school. I was always writing. Um, I was always writing. I'm talking about, first of all, I started always reading. I used to read so much that I got in, I literally got in trouble for reading. Like I would I would finish my work in school in class to the point where I could sit and read like away from everybody. Like I've always kind of had an imagination that kind of made anything I was reading into a whole movie in my head. So I'm, you know, I'm reading a book and literally can like see everything happening. So reading was always exciting for me. Um, but then I get older and I start writing uh, rap, of course, um, started writing raps, but it wasn't even just raps. Like even like in high school, I used to write people's pay, you know, uh, uh, assignments for them. Like they're um, like, if we had a, uh, with book reports or, you know, just essays we had to write, things like that, I would write them because I just liked doing it. They would give me a little bit of money to do it or whatever, but it wasn't ever about that. I just liked doing it, you know? Um, so then I'm in high school here in Richmond and um, my teacher, Miss Dean, she saw my little notebook of, of, of raps. She's like, you write, you don't write, 16s in a hook you write just like you like if you read what you what you wrote in your rap it, it reads like a poem it can read like a poem you ever did poetry and i'm like nah i don't even really you know i haven't even really heard you know i've heard the word <laughs> i don't I, I never really i don't know what poetry is for real and so she starts she opened this world up to me of of poetry she got me she started a forensics team which is basically like competitive speaking. Yep. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's like it's like debate, but not really. It's like debate with like art, though. So you like taking other uh, works 
that have already been published and you're presenting them as your own um presenting them in your like own voice you're performing them you're trying to bring them to life in your own way um even though they're not your own personal work um so i was doing that in high school and i was actually kind of good at it and then from there i started writing my own poems and that's where everything kind of opened up for me and then i was in the navy when i got out the navy uh i came back to richmond and I ended up at Tuesday versus here in Richmond and the rest is history. Like I just never, once I walked into Tuesday versus and seen the very, one of the very first things I seen was Megan Black, Megan Blackwood, Rickman, Rickman Blackwood. Blackwood yeah. Uh, uh, Lee Jones narrator, Roscoe Burnham's um, and uh, somebody else, they did this poem called, this is what forever sounds like. The very first thing I seen was one of them on stage doing the poem and somebody jumped up in the crowd and started doing the poem with them. And somebody jumped up in the, on the other side. And I, this is my first time experiencing something like this. And I was like, yo, all right, all right. Yeah, I'm home. This is it for me. I'm good. <laughs> I, think I, I think I got my thing. I found my thing. Um, I found my thing. So that was where it all started for me because I was, so I was always writing, you know, well, since high school I was writing and poetry came in high school. I wish I could find Miss Dean. I think, oh, that would be so dope if I could find Miss Dean, you know? You know what? But Facebook is good for everything. I've been looking. I promise I've been looking. I can't find her nowhere, but somebody going, I'm going to run into her. I, I know I am. You know the high, look, 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 look. Find your high school alumni group. They'll know. Where? Okay. I'm They'll always it. know. I promise you. Mine, mine's like that too. I found a. I'm actually friends with my sixth grade teacher on Facebook. Don't, don't, don't. But yeah, that's where. Um, that's where I started. How I started writing. I'm gonna shout her out while I'm thinking about a high Miss Kincaid. <laughs> so. Word. Um. Now, I mean. I mean, now that we've gotten past the how you got in, so now, I guess, what we were talking about, okay, so we were talking about forms and editing and that kind of stuff. So what does your, this is a good leading question for what I'm coming, what's coming next. What does your process look like? Like- I have no clue. Do you? <laughs> um, I say I this mean, because we've had people on here who said, I need to be like, we have somebody that I need to be in a coffee shop. It's a great place for me to write, or I need silence, or I need to listen to music. And then when the people who listen to music, some of them will say, I need to listen to instrumentals because I can't listen. Like, like what does that, I mean, what do you need and what does that process look like for you? Um, or maybe you don't have one. Do you have to write? I don't necessarily music? know that I have one because when I was talking earlier about finding joy, and like everything, any even the little things, um, part of that was not being able to see poetry and things. Got it. Um, so basically, what happens is, if 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 I have anything of a process, what happens is, I think poetry is in and of everything. You just gotta see the poem and certain people are going to see certain poems the poems are going to call themselves out to certain people like it wasn't for you to write it was for me to write and vice versa you know what i mean so if it was for you to write like like whether you write it or not is completely up to you but the poem is going to reveal itself so if i have any kind of a process it's living who was it? I, I want to say, <clears throat> forgive me, I'm going to paraphrase this. Mm -hmm. Probably, probably, probably a little off. I think it was 13 and I'm I'm shouting out your husband, Kaniki. I believe 13 told me once that if you run out of things to write about, you need to go out and basically live life so that you have stuff to write about. <laughs> what I'm saying, like, that's exactly what, I, if, if there's any kind of process for me, that's what it is. So basically um, the idea of needing a certain setting 
I can say that sometimes I want music, sometimes I don't. Um, I can say that sometimes I need a glass of I need a glass of whiskey. Sometimes I need some water. Sometimes like like those things vary. Those things vary. But the one thing that remains constant is how I find the poem. She and said, that's, she said her dad said it. Oh she word. Not 13. She said her dad said it. Word. Um, so like I'll have a conversation with somebody. I'll see a commercial on TV. I'll, you know, anything, have a random thought, like something to see a post on Facebook and be like, yo, that's because people didn't think about that part with this, that, and third. And it's for certain people. It's for how you think, how you, how you interact, how you express, you know what I mean? Like that poem will reveal itself to you in your heart or in your mind, however it comes out that way. So that's, like my process and then I just sit down and I just kind of throw up on throw up on whatever page if I'm typing or whatever I just throw up and then I pick pieces out yep. and then you know I put those off to the side like okay this is what I'm trying to say and then I look at it again and be like well no nah, I wasn't trying to say none of that I was actually trying to say this and then I rearrange and 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 I go I, I, I what I do know is most of the time I have my ending I can say that most of the time my ending has already hit me That's and I'm building a poem to my ending. That's interesting. That doesn't usually stay my ending. It usually ends up going somewhere in the middle of the poem and I end up usually ending it a different way, but I usually start with my, end, with my ending. Um, and I both saying the same thing. Like that is super interesting. I'm a yeah, it's, the, it's like the literally a line. It's like literally a line that I'd be like, I got to get to this line. Like when I do this line, it's going to be crazy. I just need to explain to this line. Um, most of the time it ends up moving up to the middle of the poem. Um, but the the hardest part is the intro. I, because once I start, because once I get the intro, I'm so in my head about trying about, about where I know I want to go. Um, I'm so in my head about where I know I want to go that that getting there becomes the real uh, getting there becomes the real issue. But once I start the poem, once I start, once I get the first line, I don't have to. I don't think anymore. That's the no. The, the first line or the first stanza, I don't think at all anymore. I just now I'm just writing. It's just go, it just goes. Breeze, because. I am the um, queen of the opening. I can open a poem. Mm. I can give you the first couple of lines like this. I cannot write into the, like, I, I, I can't get to the close. I want to mm. say the poem that I'm known for the most is an erotic poem that I sat on for six months because I could not figure out how to land it. Mm. Because I wanted the landing to be as strong as the opening and I couldn't. In a similar, in a similar sense, in a similar sense, there's a poem I've been working on for a well for a little over a year. Mm -hmm. If shit might be longer, honestly, now that I think about it, and it's because I don't like any of the beginning. Really, like the ending, like the end, of the, like the end of the poem, the middle to the end of the poem is exactly what I know I want to say, but mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm leading in. I'm. I don't feel like the transition into it is is as adequate. I feel like it's very good for another poem. I am the opposite of both of y'all in that. I feel like it's very I good for another I'm poem. I'm such a concept writer that whatever I start with is usually right dead smack in the middle so that it gets to the point I'm trying to make right there. Intro, I can do. Ending, I have sometimes problem landing, but I start and work outward. So like I never have the beginning. <laughs> I never have, like, nice. I have a concept, and I want to write around it, so I know where to place stuff. Like that's awesome. That's all right. You know. Okay. You so know what? Can I have five poets in this back room? I'm waiting for the fifth one to turn on their camera. So, Kaniki, I'm gonna ask you the question that we are apparently all answering right now: Is how do you start? Is it middle? Is the end? Is it constant? I'm like Breeze. I start with the end. Wow. Oh, yeah. I thought we didn't. But you know what? I've never asked this. Let, let me say this. 
um, 13, if you listen to his poetry, it's all full circle. So you maybe you should try this. Like whatever he starts with, if you listen to his poetry, all his poetry is 360. Whatever he starts with at the beginning is at the end. It's, it's at the end too. It's, yeah. It's, it's I, the, I said, you write, yeah. 13, you write 360 poetry. So whatever point you're yeah. trying to make in the end, in the beginning, you make it in the end. It's like a full yeah. circle. I do that with my regular stuff that I never thought to do. I never think to do it with my poetry. I promise you. Like it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. That's analysis. Nice. Same question. I oh. <laughs> well, I, it's instant. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing and enjoying this whole conversation that I'm listening to, um, because what it tells me, I, obviously, there's no one way and no right way or wrong way. And I think that for many of us, it can be a multiple of these things. You know, it depends on how the concept hits. So, right. uh, if, if, if I'm getting a concept, um. It, it, first of all, a lot of my pieces just come from the topic itself. Okay. Uh, my piece about the, the racist mascot sports cast. Well, I knew for a long time I wanted to deal with that. It's an issue I've been, been involved with. So the concept was already there. Um, that piece is in two parts, and, and the first part of it is a mock broadcast. But that comes from some protest activity I was in. It was it was part of the way that we we uh protested. Yes. So, yeah. so that's a way in which the actual lines in the writing jump off of your experience, you know, and right. what you were doing. Now there are other times well, I got a question after he finished too. Yeah. Now, that I, now he just said that. Right. And then but something like recruitment, um uh which starts and tell me when you kill it, what will it feel like? That is so it's, it deals with the military industrial complex and my my tearing the US a new asshole as far as its foreign policy and and, and imperialism. But that the before those lines got written, there was a whole nother opening line in my head that jumped off of Veterans Day, and the line was going to be, I do not celebrate Veterans Day, I mourn it. That that was going to be an opening line. Now, that's when I thought I was gonna come in right from that line. I never used that line, but the concept from a, from it went in in the recruitment. So, so his lines, his, his line didn't line. even become. You didn't his even line didn't wasn't even right. Right, his line became the concept. Right, his, and, the, the beginning time. became the concept of the poem. He wrote something completely. He didn't use that line at all. That happens too. That happens, that happens a, lot. a lot. So I might jump into it. So it depends. So it like like girl genius saying, the first thing I think about might be in the middle of a poem, right. might end up in the middle of a poem. Whatever the, the key cornerstone concept of, of it is, it can end up in the middle of it. It can be in, the, it might be a first line. Uh, it might end up being a closing, but it comes for me right, in the concept. In the and I put it where it's supposed to be long and, and, and build it around it. I think the Interesting. Only I now that I really think about this, one of the, okay, so I talked about the, the erotic poem that I'm known for. That line started in the middle mm -hmm. and I built around it and sparkly things started in the middle and I built around it. I, right. think, that she, with, I think that with only one, I think I only have one poem in, in my arsenal current mm -hmm. where the concept line was the first line mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's the library poem. And that's that yeah. poem, that, my that concept. Poem line was stuck in my head for years. And then I was like, all right, forget it. We're using it. And so I just stuck it right up front and just kind of went there. Was my concept lines, line. my concept lines usually are my ending and they may move to the middle. Mm -hmm. But like, I know I have the thought of what I want to write about. I have the line that I feel like is going to tear them up when they hear it at the end. Mm -hmm. And then I just build towards that. But I wanted to ask, because he was talking about the, the stuff he write about be topic based in a sense of experience. He was at like a march or whatever. He was doing some kind of protest and the thought of whatever hit him. How do, how do you, I know people who don't have an experience to, who don't need an experience to write. And I am, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to I don't know how to write without an experience. Wow. It, like, I just feel like I'm lying. I feel like I'm lying. You know, the interesting thing, Breeze, as, as you bring that up, um, uh, because I write obviously partially from from experiences I've had. Uh, I have a poem 
dealing with anti-immigrant hate that comes from my work as an organizer on that issue. So sometimes it comes from experience. Work as an organizer, you inexperienced. Yeah, work. Now, now there are other times though, um, I go back to recruitment. So I'm not a vet. Okay, I've I've never I've never been in the military. I'm not a combat vet. Uh, but I knew that I I wanted to deal with this whole matter of U.S. imperialism and and, and the military industrial complex. What happened? Mm. So the question is, how do you do that without coming off wannabe and bullshit? Because you know, because I wasn't a combat vet, so to, it, it, I did not want to you know try to front. Right. To say that I had that experience. And so that is the interesting challenge in poems. In that in that particular case, in that poem, um, I ended up writing it as what basically was a letter or a discussion to a young cat thinking about enlisting. So okay. that allowed me to go ahead and get my thoughts out and dump my thoughts out, but not to claim that I was a vet because that'd be some right. Body, right? You know, so whatever creative, you know, ways that you can get your mind into dealing with a subject. Now you got to come with know what you're talking about. So, I mean, I was, it was research, research. and, and right. I'm drawn from people's experience that I know personally. I'm drawn from stuff I've researched. I'm drawn from, you know, so forth and so on. Things that I know from, from activist work, all of that is in the poem, mm -hmm. but I had to do it in such a way that I didn't front and say that I was a vet. No, I'm not a vet, but I am critiquing this whole situation. So say all that to say, I guess, we each of us find our little creative uh, uh, ways and backdoors mm -hmm. and gimmicks into doing something. If if you feel comfortable, if one feels comfortable enough to write on something that they don't have experience in, if you don't feel comfortable enough in that, don't do it. If you don't right. have research, if your facts ain't, ain't straight, right. don't, don't do, do it. it. <laughs> right. But if you have all of that, then you find hopefully some kind of creative way into it. And that, and for that particular piece, that was mine. Maybe you raised a good question though, because- You did. Experience for you write from mind. conversation. I was yeah. gonna say, I've done poems from conversations. I've done poems from, I've done poems from experiences that aren't mine, but my take on those experiences- See that, that that's say, probably the most I've me. done. That's yeah, the most I've, I've done. Is not, I've, I haven't experienced it, but I've experienced somebody experiencing it. Right. And so how do I feel right. about that? You I think the closest thing I got to that was I have a poem about uh, Marissa Alexander. Um, and so, of course, that's not my experience. I didn't go through that, but I have a daughter, right? So I have a daughter who I have to have watch grow into a woman. Now, how do I feel? about the idea that something like this could happen to her and on so many different aspects or levels like yo like it could be a situation of a guy trying to put their hands on her or it could be the situation of going through this you know crazy justice system where they'll let this man over here you know get uh they'll let this man over here get uh scared or whatever for uh a uh, little boy that's walking around because he's scared for his life because he's following around this little boy. They'll give him a stand your ground law, but they won't give the woman who's you know trying to retreat from a situation where she was getting abused. They won't give it to her. She could be that girl. You know what I mean? Like, and that makes it personal. And that's, and and that's your experience. That's, that's your experience. It it personal. Now, now, like, but yeah. I can also tell you there are poems that I have like listened to and loved like really wanting to have conversations with these poets about these poems like yo what happened what was the backstory what was the whole you know what how did that how did you get here with that poem and they will have to tell and they will t I, I, nothing i just i just made it up what right like what what yeah. i'm like i mean i don't even uh does it I'm not trying to say it in a negative way, so I don't know how it feel to give examples. You know what I'm saying? To give examples, but like, it's just certain poems you would never expect. Right. Somebody wasn't going through that thing. You know what I mean? And I'm not trying to downplay it at all. It takes a, an immense level of creativity to make, like your imagination gotta be, like what the fuck? Like that's not human, that's, that's something crazy. You know what I mean? Like it's good enough to write your experience down in a creative way, but to not have it and create 
a story or, or something that somebody could like I'm not downplaying it at all. So I'm not trying to be negative about it. I'm just I don't know, I don't know what that looks like for me. Mm -hmm. Um I can write I can write to no experience with a ton of research, but I can't, you know, I can't just not in poetry anyway. Can I can I write and you know pull from my imagination? Yeah, I started off as a fiction writer, I can do that all day. Right. <laughs> you know, but I try to I personally try to be as authentic as possible mm -hmm. in, with my poems, even if it's not my specific experience. Like I think I've written a domestic violence poem and I can't I can't say that the 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 experience was not that experience was not mine. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. I, and and But see uh, it's like it's like this. It's like uh ah, his, the name is escaping me. Uh OCD, the love poem. You know what I'm talking about? I can't I remember so, the guy's yeah. name. Like, that's not his experience. He doesn't, you know what I'm, you know yeah, what I'm yeah, talking about? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think I know what you're talking about. I can't remember his name all of a sudden. I can't, like, I see it, like, I hear it, and I can't, I, right. I, it's going away. But, that, but, like, but, like, if you, if you go, you wouldn't, how would you be able to, you know, how would you be able to, write that story i'm thinking it's along the lines of like and i've done this with conceptual stuff too it's uh so one of my favorite books is uh one of my favorite books is uh da -da -da, on writing stephen king on writing mm -hmm. and it's you know one of the things is that he talks about in there is basically this idea of in order to do all the scary books it's what if this thing did this and he has like a bunch of impo like a mm. list of impossible scenarios and a list of like random objects and he just basically draws a line from one to the other and like okay what if a car suddenly became possessed and started killing people or what if right. you know, like, like you can do that kind of stuff like what if this happened and that would be I haven't had this experience. No, I've never had a car go crazy and start killing people. But yeah, I can write right. the entire thing about this. And I think that's kind of where some of this stuff comes in, where somebody could go, no, this hasn't happened, but what if it did? What would that look like? Right. And then you just write the poem. And that's how you, and that's, that's a process for doing it without the experience. Right. Neil Hillborn. Yeah. I, I, I totally, yep. I saw his face and I was like, I couldn't think of it either. Um, that yeah, good. That, really good. if you see this poem, there's no way, there's no way you would ever fathom that that's not, you know, a condition he's suffering or whatever. But like, as if, which, please don't quote me on this because this is just what I've heard, what, what, what people have told me. I don't know um, specifically, I don't know him specifically, so I can't say whether he does or not or doesn't. But from what I've I'm only using the example just for the sake of using an example. If this is the case, because I've heard it, because people have said it to me, if this is the case, how? How How do you do that? <laughs> you know I mean? That's so crazy to be so intricate with a story that some, that's something you, you know, haven't experienced, you know what I'm saying? Or, or you didn't go through that that experience specifically. Like, that's, that's amazing to me. I, to put that on you to do a poem like that uh, not the ocd poem i mean like think about a what if scenario and what that would look like for you try it and again yeah. you know, the authenticity because apparently the poem you're describing breeze i had to look it up for something but um apparently does it with an authenticity that makes it legit because it is yes. real it is a thin line to step into some bullshit when you try to, right when people try to do stuff they talking out the side of the neck without knowing or without having research or without having right. personal attachment to it experience. It's a thin line between that and that's what I'm scared of. Authentically, uh, you make me think of uh, Ob West's piece uh, about um, where he's personifying somebody that has a stutter. Mm -hmm. Now, I and it's funny because it, it occurs to me I've never asked Ob if he actually. If that is his experience personally, if he overcame stuttering or not. So maybe he has personal experience with that. Maybe he does not. Let's for the sake of this conversation and say he does not. He did it so richly and, and respectfully is the word I'm looking for. Respectfully mm -hmm. to that community 
and with all authenticity that it worked, mm -hmm. you know? So right. that's an interesting thin line. Yeah, like even when I did the Marissa Alexander poem, I was calling women, yo, are y'all sure? Like, this is the poem. Does this Is this offensive? Like, am I saying something out the way? Like, it might not have been. It was research on the, the case and everything as far as the cases she had to deal with. But it was more so research with I'm speaking because when you listen to the poem, I'm speaking as if I'm Marissa. So I'm giving my feelings about think and thinking about my daughter because I'm writing a poem from Marissa Alexander to my daughter. So it's it's my feelings and thoughts on what if she's in a situation like this, what would I, you know, like her to know, want her to think, but I'm using Marissa Alexander's voice. So I'm portraying the voice of a woman, but apparently, of course, I'm not a woman. So I'm calling women like, yo, I'm not mansplaining the shit out this woman's voice, am I? Like, you know what I mean? And it was a couple key things in there that I wouldn't have known where the, where, 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 where triggering or maybe could, could be taken offensive. It was a couple things in there. You know what I'm saying? I said something about a, um, uh, 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 like you're the one with a sickness. Uh, um, I can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember. But it was a couple things in there that was like, no, don't say that because that belittles this and it makes it look like this, this, that, and the third. And that's not what you know we identify as, you know, what I mean, when we go through stuff like this, whatever, like that. So yeah, I mean, the research of it is very pertinent. It's very important. Um, but like, like research a thought. Or, well, I mean, no, nah, I'm just, I mean, just going to accept the challenge. I'm just going to accept the challenge like that. I'm because because what happens now that this conversation is happening is my mind goes. Yes. I'm, I'm out. of here. I'm not even here anymore. My mind is writing a poem. Or right. trying to right, right now. I mean, That's take, take it, take it and run. I mean, take take a do a what if scenario. Take a mm -hmm. a non experiential what if scenario. I've done what if scenarios a couple times, and and mm -hmm. you know if it's something that you think is you're taking on now, it's different to assume a voice that's not yours and not vet that with as you should vet that with someone in with those voices. Somebody, with the, you're right, exactly. That's a whole different story. Like I, I've done that. I've vetted poems in a room full of people going, am I okay to do this? Does it, does it come off wrong? Am I taking on something that's not mine? Right. I, you definitely should do that, vet that. But if it's not a right. controversial topic, you, you're, you're free to just say, okay, this is not my lived experience, but what if this happened? What here, let me write this poem. If I was in this right. position, what would I do with this? And it's not a, it's, and you know, as long as you do it respectfully, it's not, you're not right. stepping on things. Word. Okay. This is dope. This is dope. So, I love Grace, this as we, start to, as we start to close out, I definitely have a couple of questions that I want to ask. Okay. The first one is um, you choose to use a stage name, Breeze the Poet. Yes, ma'am. Where did the name come from? What do you want the audience to get from that name? Nothing. Don't pay no attention to it. It's stupid. I I rap. I was rap. I'm, I'm a rapper. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. Somebody said something. I I had a rap name. Mm -hmm. I just feel so corny talking about it. I had a rap name, <laughs> and um, I had a rap name, and it was like uh, I can't even remember what it was, but I was trying to change it because whatever it was. Somebody who was more established had a version of it or had the same name or something. So I'm trying to think of another name to go by. And um, somebody in a song uh, said something about um, Breeze. Uh, call me Breeze because you can't see me, but you can feel me or some shit like that. And it was like, huh. And then uh everybody around just start caught like i had a couple people around me when we heard it it was like yo that's why nah that's kind of stupid and then they were like nah that's you and then and this is when i was in school so now they're going around school just calling hey that's a breeze yeah yeah oh so you've had this name for a while. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, this is like, like, yeah, like high school. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that ain't Breeze. Who is Breeze? Breeze is. Oh, that's. Oh, his name Breeze now. Oh, okay. And now the whole school calling me Breeze, and then that just, it just, I just didn't feel like fighting it no more. So. I'm over here laughing because I don't think I ever told yeah, yeah. you that my DJ name in college days was Cool Breeze. <laughs> so as I'm over here smiling. So like yeah, I'm like in super unenthused about this 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 point in the conversation because I feel corny. If you sound like people be having very intricate and like, oh my names mean this in Swahili, and I was like, no, 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 no. no, no. I like, kind of okay, stole so it from somebody's everyone, bar. Somebody said a bar and a rap, and I stole it. Um, for <laughs> everyone even that to. is here. <laughs> On our YouTube channel, um, our uh, interview with Pages Matam is loaded. And I do believe he told us that he got his name, and I think this part of the interview was posted. He got it from the Poetry Club. The Poetry Club started calling him Pages because of how many pieces of paper he walked in with. Yeah, I believe that's what he said. (laughs) They called him Pages. (laughs) And it stuck. Okay, so so yeah, people just start calling me, just start calling me Breeze, and I couldn't get away from it. So, as we alluded to earlier, um, what have you been? What were you doing to practice self care? Because I get one hundred percent what you're saying about being in the online spaces and trying to perform, trying to host the online spaces is hard. It, it, it's not easy work. It was not easy work. Um, and we're just starting to get back live here in DC. So mm-hmm. what were what were you doing to maintain your mental health and self-care during the quarantine? This is the thing. My uh, the problem with the problem with the my attempt at finding self-care is that it goes hand in hand with what the problem is in the first place. The problem is we couldn't work Mm -hmm. as artists. We couldn't work. And when I see myself getting into a depressive state, I maybe, maybe it's unhealthy, but I just overload myself with work so that I don't get a chance to like think about it or have enough time to sit in it before I got something else I need to be doing. The problem with that was there was no fucking work. So, um, like, so, like, you know, I, I, I definitely did try to like. I, I created my own open mic that I was doing online. I still have the dojo, which is a a, a service, a, a slam coach, editing kind of performative uh, uh, service that I give. Was like you, you sign up with me for like a month. Um, and then I go through your poems and I edit them and I show you how to, you know, or how to perform them and give you prompts for new work, stuff like that. So like I was working on that. I had a um, open mic that I was doing. Um, I had, was hosting a slam. Um, I was just trying to find any form of getting that energy that I was missing back in in some way shape form or fashion like and it just i don't know it, it wasn't really you know what i mean that was the problem it's like the way i would find my peace i couldn't you know was unavailable i get it i get it i get it analysis do you have any questions well i uh, first of all it's great to see you and hear you as always my brother and and especially in this format where um you know, I got to hear even more uh, than we've talked about before uh, and more about you. And that's right on. Um, one of the things that, that poetry generally, and especially our uh, subgenre of it in terms of spoken word does for me is that it both allows folk to express their spirituality and at the same time uh, does so in a dynamic and challenging way that challenges um much of the the institutionalized uh religious systems and it breaks down a lot of the the uh bullshit that has come through uh institutionalized religion and so forth and so on 
you know, and I hear that coming from your poetry a lot. You know, uh, the, the poem that you did to open up with uh, certainly uh, has the spiritual and scriptural references. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the very dynamic and awesome piece, um, uh, Praise Dance of a Sinner, uh, is something that uh, for me personally, and, and part of my background is as a minister. So I wish, oh, if I can make uh, faith bodies and congregations hear that poem, I'd assign it uh, mm. as required listening. Um, and so so your poetry is very powerful in its drawing from spirituality uh, and, and faith practice, and at the same time, challenging uh, and breaking down some of the stereotypical remorse. Do you find that you have an opportunity to perform in faith settings uh, and bodies in terms of local congregations and mosques or, or wider uh, conference uh, judicatories and denominational settings. Do you, do you find you have those opportunities? Uh, are they compensating for those opportunities? Do you, do you, is there inroads in that uh, for you as an artist? I've been, it's been a suggestion forever. Like, I haven't delved into it, but it's been a suggestion forever. I just performed Tuesday at Versus, and uh, and um, the poem I did was the Praise Dance of a Sinner. And, like, so many people was like, yo, you need to come to this church. Like, we want you to come to this church and this, this, that, and the third. Um, I've performed at a church two, probably three times in my life. Mm, maybe four. Um, probably two of them were like compensated. Uh, no, three. Three of them were compensated. So, but they were always through somebody else. It was never like, yo, a church hit me up and said, yo, come talk, come speak at my church. Like, uh, I've never, I've never had those interactions. It was always somebody had a gig at a church and said, Joe, you should come with me. Um, mind you, even with that being the case, I have enough spiritual based poems to have like a EP of like just that, you know what I mean? Um, I, I, uh, like mo a lot of the, my, a lot of the people, a lot of people's favorites are the faith, the, the kind of faith or spiritual based poems or praise dance of a sinner. Uh, I got a poem called, um, uh, I got a poem uh, called Storms. A lot of people love, love uh, storms, um, a lot, uh, unfamiliar faces. And we, uh, God has a way of showing up in the most unfamiliar faces. Uh, strangers passing by sometimes possess healing and hellos children laughing can restore faith when you've lost hope for the future nothing to boost your morale like a smile like an unexpected smile or a sudden request for one of yours when you forgot you possess that ability like that's like somebody like nice and, and like specifically shout out to courtney courtney the poet in south carolina like if i come down there and don't do that poem she's gonna lose it you know what i mean so like they definitely received from me and I've definitely, especially in the beginning, like initially I was like kind of coined as a pastor kind of poet for the way I performed. The way I performed, people always kind of took me as like, oh, like he just, he just jumped out of somebody church. So, um, but no, I haven't delved into like those venues, those settings. Um, I would like to, it would be dope. Yeah, feel you. I should get on that. Let's, let's, let's on. talk about that because it's a route I'm about to crack into also. So we can wrap on that. I was about to say, okay. um, I have exactly two very short questions for you, two. And then I'm going to have you close out with a poem and then we're going to close out the show. Cool? Okay. Okay, cool. So the first one is I always end my interviews asking, uh, what is since we were talking about books your favorite uh book author quote book author or quote um damn i gotta pick one um I know everybody has the same the same thing just yeah pick pick one to leave it? i like to leave people with one book okay book author or quote um 
Uh, Dante Collins, I think his name is. Mm-hmm. He has a book called Autopsy. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to drag it out, but oh, my God. It's, it's fucking incredible. Oh, damn it. Did you say one? Never mind. <laughs> no, I, mean, I mean, if you have another one, go ahead. Um, R.J. Walker has a book that's like poems that are like themed. It's a it's themed off of Pokemon. Oh yeah, I know. I yeah, I know RJ. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. So those two are like top of my list. Like, yo, what in the hell am I reading? This is crazy. Awesome stuff. I'm gonna say usually if we were live, and we're still gonna do it when we have this when it's broadcast, we'll we'll list books and things that people recommend always. I'm I'm trying to curate a big long list that we can post on our website. We had some really, and they didn't have to be poetry books. I mean, it's just a list of all things. But right. uh, my le- very, very last question before I let you close us out with a poem is this. Now that you have been on this show, we wow. always ask who, and that, not just for my segment, for, for Sherry's segment is um, from behind the microphone. Uh, Nikki's segment is poets and platforms. And Charity's segment is uh, art plus therapy. Who would mm-hmm. you recommend we have on the show? Now, mind you, before you answer, we have a we have a list and we have a fight list. And the fight list is people we've been fighting to get on this show. We've been fighting over to figure out whose segment they're going in. And if we can't figure it out, we put them in our fifth week round table. So we do do one of those when we okay. have a good week. Who would I suggest to be on this show? Mm-hmm. And I gotta say one person. God. No, doesn't have to be one. You can name a couple people. Oh, if somebody else um, comes to mind, if somebody else comes to mind, email us. Jay Ward. Um, Good pick. Definitely, you should get Jay Ward up here. Stephen Willis. You should definitely get Stephen Willis up here. Um, Timothy Dwight. You should definitely get yeah. Timothy Dwight up here. Um, I'm a Mecca, Mecca, Mecca Morphosis. Mecca's already Mecca's on the list. I don't know where we're gonna be able to get. We've had most of we've had almost every member of Baltimore's team on here at mm-hmm. so far. I know we've had Kenneth, okay. I know we've had Slangston, I know we've had Jacob, and I know that uh we've had Brian. We had Brian a couple of months ago. Oh, uh, okay. So Mecca, Mecca. If, when y'all get her, and also Ashley Lumpkin. Um, uh-huh. Millie from Bull City. Yep. Those are going to be my five. I'm going to say I'm those. I'm going to say, I think somebody else suggested Ashley too. And I have to, I'll reach out to her and figure out which segment. But yeah, somebody else uh, mentioned her. Yeah. Which is great. Um, I am going to step out. I'm going to let you close out, close out with a poem. And then I will have uh, Sherry come back and announce like what we're doing for next week. <laughs> So okay. I am going to mute myself now and step out of the picture. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank y'all so much for having me. Thank y'all so much for you know listening to this. This has um been a wonderful experience, a wonderful conversation. I am in between on what poem to do to close, but I want to do one that I don't normally do because I just wanted to take this opportunity to do do that. That's why I did the poem I did it first. That was like a newer poem that I haven't um, done before. But uh, I think that I'll do this poem. Please excuse my niece and nephew in the background. Um, I apologize for that, but they are being kids. And so actually I take that back. I won't apologize for kids being kids. That's, that's not what we do. But please excuse them being kids in the background. Um, but you got kids, so I hope you understand. <laughs> um, so anyway, off that, I'll do this poem and I will get out of your way. Thank you so much once again. My love is beautifully horrific. Like the kissing scene in a scary movie. You live for the moments, but you know pretty soon something is going to die. This movie has horrible casting. Sometimes I am an extra in my own love, but I play myself often. 
In character as a person who loves hard and will bleed to keep it haunted by the ambivalence of romance, I can't tell if hope is half full or half less. So if this is a movie about my love, then here's the plot. Uh, there are roses with razor wire for thorns. I play the role of a masochistic gardener who wants something beautiful so badly that I try to save these roses from men with white vinegar soaked kisses and lawnmower language. All the things that kill flowers, I pick them, pull them from the root of themselves, even though they never asked me to. I cut myself on their distrust and I bleed my love all over them anyway. Flashback. Uh, I imagine myself as a flower, you know, every movie has to have like a flashback, kind of like an origin story segment of the movie. So I imagine myself as a flower worth nurturing and feeding that someone would love and watch grow into something beautiful one day. But all I've ever known is rubbing alcohol, heal and salt water kiss. Ironically, as much as I try to save these flowers, these are also things that kill flowers. So this story is about learning how to hold a flower about finally finding something beautiful that won't hurt me, about realizing that if you are too selfish to let love be itself, then it will hurt you. Okay, that was the flashback of the movie. So here now we're at the present. This is the present. Uh, I pick these flowers. I plant them into my bed. I feed that earth with my kisses and they die. The petals wilt the soil becomes barren. I become barren when bearing the weight of losing things I love so much, even though they hurt me. And sometimes when they have hurt me, I confront myself, staring at scarred hands, trying to figure out why they look more like war, war wounds than passion marks. I look up and I ask any mirror, why don't you love me? The mirror smiles as if it knows that no one can save me now. It answers, I do love you. Don't you see the scars, silly? Loving things hurts. I mean, remember what your love did to those beautiful roses, all the wilting and the bearing. That was love. You call that love, right? And so here is the plot twist of the movie because my love is a scary movie full of plot twists and metaphors and bad casting. And I'm so extra in my love that I play myself often a hopeless romantic with a kiss like a murder weapon. My embrace is a crime scene. And I now I just realized that I am the villain, the serial lover who kills everything he kisses. These flowers were a metaphor for the beautiful things that I have loved that have hurt me before, that have made me this way. See, I don't know how to love myself. So I've accepted the bleeding and death from beautiful things. Therefore, have been bleeding my death all over every beautiful thing that I've planted into all of this dust. Dying, and I've been calling that shit love the whole time. And I am still a gardener that has a knack for picking the most beautiful roses for funerals. In the end, the final scene, I go to where the beautiful things I have loved all, but instead find tombstones. I visit the twisted plots I've created and apologize for being such a mortician to them. I'm sorry. When you love hard and wrong like me, you kill things. And love is such a beautiful thing when you figure out how to not hold it like a weed eater. But by the time I looked up, all I seen were the flowers. I didn't realize they were dying. I didn't even recognize all the graves. It's crazy. How many times have we walked into gardens just to realize that we've given our lives to cemeteries? Thank you. I can't hear anything. I'm Everybody's I was <laughs> Thank you. I, was, I forgot that I was still on mute. <clears throat> Excuse me. First of all, in the context of hearing you say how you do from last lines, listening to that last line was like, yep, there it goes. <laughs> that was it. Yep. <laughs> that was it. That's exactly what happened. Um, that was definitely a last line that I was like, oh, oh no, this is. This is happening when I do this. Yeah, that's that's that. I'm good. <laughs> all of your um, oh. for anybody who's watching, all the info that you need for Breeze is at the bot has been running continuously at the bottom of the screen. Find him on all things social media. Uh, 
books and 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 find out where he's going to be next trust me if you've not seen him it's an experience you're going to want to be there now that we're getting kind of getting back into you know real things we have anybody that's listening from richmond i got a show sunday here in richmond um at the uh the dark room here in richmond august 1st um y'all come pull up pull up on me it's ten dollars there's an event in october that i know is being posted so go go to his yeah. page, find out about the slam that's in october yes. I yes. have. I, I had a. Um, a the, well, the last time you toured through DC, the host that you were with at 14th and V that night, literally, he was like, "Yeah, that's what Slam was gonna look like going forward after watching you." Yeah. So I wanted to say that to you. So yes, if you have never seen Breeze live, it's something you should do for your life. Absolutely. So, so with that said, everyone, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to watch. For those that are in the room, in the back room with us, thank you for joining us. This is Keep the Mic On. We will be back next Sunday, August 8th, and Charity Blackwell will be hosting LP on the art and therapy session. So I'm looking very forward to that. Also, if you are in the D.C. area, if you are in the D.C. area, please visit my website at uh, Simply Poetic Entertainment. Simply Poetic Entertainment. I have a good public school education. It is spelled exactly as it sounds. I have two shows coming up in the Olney area of Maryland, which will include fellow co-host Charity Blackwell, past guests of Keep the Mic On, Analysis, and... Um, there's another past guest, Megan Rickman will be on that show. Future guests will be on that show. So it's an opportunity for you to see them live for free. So please go to my website. All the information is there. Thank you again, everyone. And you guys have a great day. We'll see you next week. See you next Bye. week, guys.